I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and uh, we'll jump into the Word tonight. Father, we're, we're so grateful for the Scriptures, and uh, God, we pray that you would stir within us a hunger for your Word. Uh, God, maybe, maybe uh, we have a great appetite for the Scripture, and I, I thank, thank you for that, God, if that's the case. Maybe that appetite has been waning. God, maybe we've never had it. We pray that through the work of your Holy Spirit, you would develop that within us, and God, help us to have a steady diet of your word. I pray, Lord, that there would be a, a rich experience that we would have with your word as well as we apply it to our lives, that we would know firsthand the power that you've made available to us through the Holy Scriptures. In particular tonight, I pray that you would just rebirth within us an anticipation for the coming of your Son in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you were with us a couple of weeks ago, you know that um, we did look a little bit at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as I was talking about. I was wrapping 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 up, and we were talking about uh, the pandemic. We were talking about the coming of Christ and the rapture of the church and uh, end times and how it fits. And so we found ourselves in chapter 2. And there's just a lot of rich material in this chapter. I'm not going to teach that same information again. Uh, but there was a lot of information that we didn't have the opportunity to go over. And I do just want to remind you, you know, we're living in very unique times, uh, and I think that we can count it a privilege. While some of us may be thinking, man, what a curse to live in times like this, I think the opposite is true. You, you know, we're privileged uh, to live in a very unique moment of history. And I say that, you know, specifically because of the rebirth of the nation of Israel, now, many people have said to me, hey, pastor, this whole, whole coronavirus thing, um, is this in the Bible? You know, is this in any way connected to end times events? Uh, and the truth is this, you know, this is not the first pandemic that the world has had to deal with, um, but it is unique in some regard. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily unique in um, it as a virus. I don't think that it's unique in the number of people that it's impacted but it is unique in this sense that it's happened after the rebirth of the nation of Israel. And, you know, I mean, the response to that might be, well, what does that have to do with anything? What's the big deal about Israel being reborn? Well, the big deal is this, that when it comes to prophecy, Israel sits at the center. The epicenter of all prophetic events is the nation of Israel. And, you know, there were signs that Christ gave that would ultimately precede his second coming, there were signs that would indicate that uh, that particular generation was living during the end times. He called them birth pangs, and there were different birth pangs. You know, there are uh, earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilences, you know, which is uh, the same as pandemics, uh, nations rising against nations, an increase in individuals calling themselves the Christ, and so an increase in false prophets and antichrists. Uh, and then ultimately that leads to the abomination of de uh, desolation, which is when the antichrist declares himself to be God, goes into the rebuilt temple and demands that the Jews offer sacrifices to him. All of that is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I think that uh, you know, all of those things for sure are tied to uh, the rebirth of the nation of Israel um, or to the Jewish people having a homeland again. That happened in May 14th, 1948, as God supernaturally called the Jewish people uh, back to a tract of land that he had initially given to them through Abraham, uh, but, you know, through a series of events uh, they were able to have that land again, and the Jews were able to repatriate what we call Israel today. So, you know, it's unique in this sense. This pandemic is unique in this sense. It's happened during the rebirth of the nation. Eight million people living in Israel today. Um, all of the imp uh, tools and uh, implements for worshiping in the rebuilt temple are all in place. And so, you know, I say all that just to say this. You should be excited because you really are living in the end times. Now, these individuals, look, there was an issue, there was a problem in this church. They, they believed uh, falsely that they were living during the Great Tribulation. And uh, let me just read a couple of verses and, and I'll explain. 
The Bible says in verse 1, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. Like, don't be all stressed out. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because, you know, they thought that they'd missed it, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So there were individuals that were speaking on behalf of Paul and Silas and Timothy, and they were telling the church falsely that they were actually living during the great tribulation, the day of the Lord, the time of Jacob's trouble, as is laid out in uh, the minor prophets of the Old Testament. And there was a great concern over this, you know, because this was what had happened. They were already being persecuted, and they knew that that coming time, the great tribulation, because Paul had taught them, they knew it was going to be a time of great adversity for any person that was a believer that was living in it. And so they were overwhelmed. They were really discouraged. They also knew that the rapture of the church was going to happen before the tribulation because Paul had taught them that. And so their concern was they missed the gathering of God's people to Christ. They they thought that they had missed the rapture of the church, and this really discouraged the church. Paul is going to tell them that that's not the case and that they know it's not the case because there are particular things that have to happen before the Great Tribulation, the seven-year period of global suffering. And so he says in verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means for that day, the day of, you know, the Lord, the great tribulation, will not come, number one, unless the falling away comes first, number two, unless, and excuse me, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So there are two things that have to happen before the great tribulation. Number one, there's a great falling away. You know, this is called the apostasy. This is a situation within the church where individuals who have confessed faith in Christ turn away from the faith. They deny Christ. You know, there, some people say, well, how can that happen? They must have never been really saved in the first place. The problem with that is if they weren't saved in the first place, then they wouldn't have anything to turn away from. There wouldn't be an apostasy. So there's coming a generation within the church that is going to be thinly rooted in the word of God. They're going to be individuals who really are not hungering and thirsting for God's truth. There will be no spiritual depth. And when the opposition and the adversity comes, or when false doctrine, which will be prevalent during the end times, when false doctrine begins to infiltrate the church, and by the way, we're talking about a generation of Christians who have real, really no regard for God's truth any longer. They just want to be entertained. They just want to have their felt needs met. They just want to come to church to be stroked, right? They're pixie stick, sticks Christians. They just want the sugar of the word. There's there's really no deep spiritual maturity. And so when the adversary comes to infiltrate the church with false doctrine, they are totally susceptible and easily turned away from the faith because they really have no deep spiritual roots to begin with. Paul says that has to happen first. And when that happens, it's going to be evident. Look, it's going to be so widespread. I think it's going to be shocking for those who are really true believers. The second thing that has to happen, the second thing that has to take place before the great tribulation is that the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the son of lawlessness, the man of lawlessness has to be revealed Uh, The word antichrist, compound word, the um, prefix anti means against. Christ is the anointed one. So this individual is the antichrist. Now, when John wrote his first epistle, the spirit of antichrist was already alive then. It's been alive for 2,000 years. But there is a particular individual that we call the antichrist. Um, He is going to have demonic roots. He is going to come on the scene with all sorts of solutions. Revelation chapter 6 gives the impression he comes on a a white horse bearing tidings of peace. He is going to have so much seemingly supernatural wisdom that he's going to be able to solve problems that the world up to this point has not been able to solve. 
Part of the solution is going to be the development of a one world global order where there will be one political system initially broken up into 10 kingdoms that he will ultimately rule over. There will be one financial system, one global currency. By the way, there's a big push for that right now. Um, some of you know that the uh, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has its own global currency. And, you know, there's just been a, a lot of uh, interest in establishing that as the currency that everyone uses, that uh, is con controlled outside of particular nations, so nations can't use their currency to, to be leveraged against other nations. And, and then in addition to that, we know that um, it's going to be a cashless society, uh, probably, you know, well, for sure, there's going to be a mark of the beast, probably some type of uh, radio transmitter that's implanted in the right hand or in the forehead of individuals. You won't be able to buy without it. You won't be able to sell without it. Um, it'll probably contain, it's a biometric device that can, contains all of your health records. It will be able to indicate whether, you know, you have gotten the coronavirus or you haven't gotten the coronavirus, you'll be easily tracked. Look, all of this right now seems to make a lot of sense. I mean, there's a lot of people thinking that, that we should be able to track those who've contracted the coronavirus. A lot of people are really concerned about their information or identity being stolen. And so look, why, why have a credit card? You know, you go to the store today and for some stores you walk in and they're not accepting cash anymore because they're concerned that there might be latent coronavirus that's attached to your dollar bill or your 20 or your 100 or whatever it might be. And so, you know, the solution to that even beyond a credit card is just to have something implanted in your hand or in your forehead that gets scanned and the withdrawal from the account's already taken. You go to Starbucks, you know, you get your, you wave your hand past the reader and uh, your latte. That will probably cost 10 bucks at that point. Uh, is deducted from your bank account. So, so this individual, you know, most likely is already on the scene, and he is the uh, that that pronouns important. You know, he is the antichrist. Now, there is some description here, verse four, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple. That's a, a big deal, right there, of God showing himself that he is God. And then the postscript here, Paul says this, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So again, I said this a couple weeks ago, Paul didn't leave uh, these believers in the lurch. When he was there for three weekends in a row, he talked to them about the coming Antichrist. He talked to them about the Antichrist uh, fulfilling, remember, there's going to be a seven-year contract that the Antichrist establishes with the nation of Israel. Three and a half years into that contract, he is going to break it. He's going to go into the temple. He's going to commit the abomination of desolation. Now, when Paul wrote this epistle, the second temple was still standing. So Paul expected this to happen during the second temple period. But 2,000 years later, we know the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and there hasn't been a temple that has sat on top of the temple mount for nearly 2,000 years, uh, you know, and that was a total impossibility until the Jews were allowed to repate, repatriate the nation. But not only that, it was a total impossibility up until the point of 1967, where during the Six-Day War, the Jewish people gained control of the Temple Mount again. And uh, it would have been a total impossibility without all the uh, tools and uh, the different furnishings for the temple for God to be worshipped again, which, by the way, all of them are in place. All of them have been made. Uh, the e even the ephod for the high priest has been created. They're ready to worship God again in the third temple, the rebuilt temple. And most likely the Antichrist is going to come along and he's going to provide the solution because right now, you know, on top of the Temple Mount, there's the Dome of the Rock and there's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And so there is no worship, there is no Jewish worship on top of the Temple Mount. Even though the Jews have political control, they do not have religious control. Some people believe the solution is this, the Antichrist is going to come along. He's going to propose that a partition wall is built on top of the Temple Mount, where on one side, the Jews can worship in a rebuilt temple, which will take about two to three months to build. 
and the Muslims can c- continue to worship in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And, you know, that probably is going to be the way that it works. He'll come as a man of peace. Um, he will establish a one world system. He will have a false prophet who will be working on his behalf, encouraging people ultimately to worship him. He will bring solutions. And of course, there will be a rebuilt temple uh, in which he will go into and declare himself to be God. Verse six, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. By the way, this is just so good. Um, I I think Paul is saying here that the influence of the Holy Spirit through the church is going to be taken away at the rapture of the church. It's not that the Holy Spirit won't be present on earth because for goodness sakes, he's omnipresent. He has to be present on earth. But remember, the church is the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And the influence of the Spirit through the church is taken away uh, via the rapture. And when that happens, then the Antichrist will be revealed. For seven years, he will rule and he will reign. That will all culminate in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And when Christ comes again, it's not going to be a battle. It's not going to be some, you know fight as if the Antichrist is as strong as Jesus Christ, right? They're not going to go toe-to-toe in the octagon, knock knock down, drag out. That's just not the way it's going to be. It'll be a simple victory for the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it will just be the brightness of his coming, the breath of his mouth, and the Antichrist will be destroyed. In fact, if you read Revelation chapter 19, and I want to encourage you just to uh, read that chapter. It talks about the second coming of Christ and the, the war at uh, the Valley of Armageddon, the Valley of Jezreel, the Bible says that when he comes back, the first two that he will cast into the lake of fire that's burning with brimstone will be the Antichrist and the false prophet. He goes on to say in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So it's totally demonic in nature. There's a false trinity that is at work, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Uh, There will be supernatural signs, expressions of power, and lying wonders. So there will be things that will be done that will be clearly supernatural, but they won't be signs pointing to Jesus Christ. They will be false lying signs pointing to the Antichrist. You know, somebody once said this a long time ago, and I think it's true. They said, disciples don't follow signs. Signs follow disciples. Disciples don't follow signs and wonders. Signs and wonders follow disciples. You know, you've got to be careful because the adversary is a, is a being not to be trifled with. And during this particular period of time, there will be supernatural signs that the Antichrist and the false prophet are able to work that will direct people not to Jesus Christ, but to the Antichrist. Why? Because the devil is a deceiver. You know, not to get ahead of ourselves, but at the end of the millennial reign, he's going to be, Satan will be released again. The Bible says he will deceive the nations. This is what he does. He cloaks the lie in the truth. He entices people to think that what is false and what is unrighteous and what is against God is actually true and pleasing to God. That's what he does. He's the deceiver. And it goes on in verse 10 to describe this. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because, why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Look, you want to really protect yourself against the deception of the devil, the thing you need to do is love the truth. You need to love the truth. I appreciate that phrase. You know, Paul could have said a lot of things here. He could have said, know the truth. He could have said, appreciate the truth. He could have said, uh, to have an understanding of the truth. Uh, I'm not saying that those things are bad, but they don't come close to really loving the truth loving the truth of God's word, loving what it is that God has said. You know, Jesus said to his disciples that they would know the truth and the truth would make them free. 
One sign of a true disciple of Jesus Christ is an affinity for, it is a love for God's truth. God's truth means something to you. So it's not as if it's just arbitrary or unnecessary or, you know, when we're talking about God's truth, it's not a burden to you. Look, there's a, there's a hunger, right? There's a, a desire that dwells within you to know more of God's truth. And, you know, there probably was a period of time where you had no interest in the Bible. For sure, that was me. Look, it wasn't just that I was disinterested. I was against the Bible. I thought it was just total foolishness. Just complete nonsense. And then I put my faith in Christ, and the Spirit began to work in my life. And what, for me, was totally unnecessary, irrelevant, and in some ways I considered it to be a joke, was now the thing I just wanted all the time. You know, I was going to college when I got saved, and I stopped going to my college classes because I couldn't stop going to church. I just could not get enough of the Word of God. Why is that? Just because I was interested in, a, in an epic or an era of, of history? Uh, why? Because, you know, I wanted to really know Christianity as a religion? No, because God speaks to us through his truth. God expresses who he is, his promises, and his plans for us through his truth. And if you really love God, you will love what he has to say. You'll love the sound of his voice. You can't, will not be able to get enough of the promises of God. Look, and there are so many promises in the scripture, you never really get to the end of them. That is what will protect you, right? Like when you're standing solidly on God's truth, when the deception comes, it will be that evident. Just a couple of days ago in a devotion, I was mentioning this, that in Scotland Yard, you know, they have a counterfeit division. And those officers, you know, they train them to be able to identify the counterfeit immediately. Like the The smallest nuance of a counterfeit is easily recognized by those counterfeit officers. And so, you know, you think, well, how do they do that? And you might think that they do that by studying the thing that's false, right? They expose themselves to the counterfeit bills, and so they memorize those. They're able to identify them, but that's not how you identify or distinguish a counterfeit. What they do at Scotland Yard is they train their officers in knowing the real thing. Like they are so familiar with the real thing that any variation from it is immediately recognized by them. And God wants you to know his truth like that. It's not enough just to rely on a pastor or a leader in your life to know the truth like that. God wants you to know the truth like that. And when you do, you defend yourself against being deceived These people, on the other hand, who turn away from the truth, who don't love the truth and are susceptible to the deception, verse 11 says, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. So God just reinforces the position they've chosen to take in their heart. You know, a lot of people reject the truth, not because it's not intellectually satisfying, not because there's some dilemma that's irresolvable and because they can't resolve that intellectual dilemma because the the truth of God's word is so contrary to their reason that they've chosen to reject it. Normally, that's not the case. Most often, people reject God's truth because there's some lifestyle that they want to live. And, you know, because they want to accommodate the lifestyle, they're, they're in this place where they can't have both those things at the same time. You know, because to live in in immoral lifestyle, but then at the same time to acknowledge that there's a God that you're going to have to stand before and give an account to is a miserable place to live. So much easier to say that that God doesn't exist and to continue to live in sin. And that, you look, that's going to happen during the Great Tribulation, but that is already happening now. We live in an era of relativism. You know, many people believe that truth is just relative. By that, I'm just saying there are people who say what's good for you is good for you. And if it's true for you, it's true for you, though it may not be true for me. And whatever you choose to believe, as long as you're sincere, that that's okay. And not just in the realm of like intellectual truth, but they would say uh, when it comes to issues of morality as well, moral relativism, you can live any lifestyle that you want and no one can tell you otherwise because if it works for you, it's okay. Now, we know that that's false. Like that even 
defies reason, right? I mean, how can, if there are no absolutes, if all things are relative, and you say all things are absolutely relative, you know you've just spoken a contradiction. You can't have both of those things at the same time. And then with respect to moral relativism, people are willing to accommodate that to a point, you know? So you're in a conversation with somebody who says, hey, if it's good for you, it's good for you. If it's, if it's good for me, so you can't tell me what to do, I say, well, what if you think that rape is okay? It, can you? Can you just do whatever you want because it seems to be working for you? No, there for sure are thresholds. People are just not honest with themselves. But this is the, the world right now. Like there, we're living in the stew of relativism. And sometimes, you know, we feel ashamed for faithfully standing for the truth of God's word. You never have to be ashamed to do that. He goes on to say in verse 12, and this is kind of what I just explained, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There it is right there. Like you need to say no more. That's really what is at the root of all of it, a pleasure uh, in unrighteousness. On the contrary, or on the other hand, Paul says in verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. Man, that's so good because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So look, I'm just going to, a couple more minutes, stressed out, anxious church, really bummed out, totally discouraged, thought they were living during the great tribulation. And Paul imparts peace to them through God's grace. Paul imparts peace to them through God's grace. Look, they're persecuted. Circumstances are difficult. It's not just a pandemic that they're dealing with. There's real opposition to their faith. Some of them are being put to death for their faith. I mean, imagine living in a circumstance like that. How can you have peace when things are so challenging? Look what Paul says here. Number one, and these are all reminders. Look, they're all reminders. I want to remind you of God's truth today. Because peace is found in God's truth. It's when you remind yourself of the promises of God. It's when you remind yourself of the things that God has done in your life and you choose to hold on to them, that your heart is steadied, that your spiritual equilibrium is regained, right? The cloud lifts and the light begins to shine on your heart again. So let me remind you of this. Number one, you're beloved by the Lord. What a great reminder. Now, I know it sounds kind of rhetorical and, you know, yeah, yeah, you know this, but it was important for Paul to say this to that church. I think it's important for me to say it to this church. Paul says, hey, you're loved. The Lord loves you. Men rejoice in that. It's not that he's got some transactional relationship with you. It's not like you're one of the many that are so many in number that he's lost count and he doesn't even know your name. It's not that he's disconnected from every circumstance and situation in in your life. No, the opposite is true. He knows you by name. He is intimately connected with you. He knows all who are called by his name. He is faithful to keep that which we have committed to him. And not only that, he is intimately connected with every detail. The Bible says that he collects every tear that we cry into the proverbial bottle. You are beloved by the Lord. The second thing is this, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation. So the second thing to encourage them was that God had selected them, that God had chosen them from before the foundation of the earth. Great verse, Ephesians chapter one, verse four says this, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Paul says, don't get all concerned about your present in, the, in, in a way where you lose your trust and faith in God, because God had this moment prepared and planned before the world was ever made. He selected you He chose you, and he did so, number three, through the sanctification of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was at work. I said this this morning. The Holy Spirit was at work in your life before you ever even knew there was a Holy Spirit. 
Before you had an inkling of how much God loved you, God was already at work in your life through the agency, through the divine work of his Holy Spirit. That should bring you peace. That should just remind you, look, if God has been faithful all the way into eternity past, if God has been faithful before I even took that step of faith, and trusted in Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God was at work in my life, illuminating my understanding, convicting me of my sin, uh, working sovereignly circumstances to bring me to a place where I was strengthened by Him to take a step of faith. If the Spirit of God has been at work in my life like that in the past, He's got my present. He's in control of the details that I'm dealing with right now. And not only that, he will be faithful to see me all the way home to heaven. Be confident in this very thing, that he who began the good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Titus 3, 5, and 6 says this, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us in little drips. No, that's not what it says. Whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So listen, be encouraged, be strengthened, be lifted up. Number one, because you're loved by God. Number two, because you're chosen by God. Number three, because all of this has been a work of God's Holy Spirit. Number four, because you're destined for glory. This is his plan, and this is what he says in verse 14, obtaining for the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Because of the work of Christ in your life, because you've been sealed by the Spirit of God, you will live forever in the presence of the glory of the Father and the Son. What an amazing thing that is. You say, well, what does that look like? Um, I want you to, later, I want you to read Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22. It'll give you an idea of the future that God has in store for you. He goes on to say in verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or epistle. So good, solid exhortation to hold to the traditions that came from the word of God. You know, a lot of people today who are, you know, some of them are deconstructing their faith and they're like, well, you know, the word of God really isn't applicable. It's not really relevant. You know, we've evolved morally. Um, These people would say, you know, that the Christian faith is anachronistic. It's out of time. It's misplaced. And yet this is the exhortation of the Apostle Paul. Those traditions that were handed down and taught to you uh, through the word of our epistle, you need to hold fast. This is exactly where the devil is going to attack you. He will entice you to drift from the word of God. To begin to, he wants you to perceive the word of God to be irrelevant to you, which is why the apostle so strongly said, it's something that you need to hold fast to. And now finally, just an expression of worship. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. God, thank you for your word tonight. We're grateful that your word is as powerful today as the day it was written, as relevant, God, is important. I pray that you'd make us lovers of truth. I pray that you would help us to cling to that which is good. I pray, God, that we would hold fast to those things that we've learned, that we'd not be susceptible to deception Father, that we would be fearless and, and, God, unashamed of what it is that your word says. Tonight, as our eyes are closed and as we're in this moment of prayer, you know, maybe you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe for you, you've never received the gospel. You've never really received the love of God. And, you know, the Spirit of God has been working in your life. You've been thinking things about God maybe that you've never thought before. You know, maybe you were raised in a Christian home and, and uh, you, you know, you've not really been practicing that, but there have been things in your life, there's just been a, a stirring in your life to get back to that foundation, you know, to, in a way, come, come home to God, to come back to God. 
All of that's happening because the Spirit of God is at work in your life. You know, God is able to, to work circumstances. This is just how amazing He is. You know, you're one of eight billion people on the face of the earth and God cares for you and every circumstance in your life, God is at work in and he's been shaping circumstances. He's been moving in your midst, in your circle. He's been touching your heart. Not just so that you can know something about him. Not just so that you can watch a service online, which is, which is good, don't get me wrong. But God wants more than that. God wants action. God wants you to take a step of faith. God wants you to believe. God wants to birth within you a love for his word. God wants you to desire him. God wants to satisfy your soul. God wants to meet the deepest needs that you have in your heart. You know, needs that no one else even knows. It's never been articulated by you to other people. God knows. God knows what you need. You're made by God. You're made in His image. You're loved by God. And today I would say that He's been at work in your life. And as you take a step of faith, you can discover that He in fact has chosen you. So right where you're at today, wherever it is, listen, you know, you can be in the craziest places watching this live or, you know, recorded. God's got something in store for you. It's a great thing. You need to take a step of faith and trust in Christ. And I want to lead you in a prayer that begins your relationship with God. God's initiated it. God has started it. Don't get me wrong. But now is your moment to respond to him. And the desire of God in your response is this, that you would turn away from unbelief and sin and that you would turn your heart to him completely and fully trusting in Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection and ascension and choosing to follow him all the days of your life as a disciple. Will you do that right now? Will you take that step of faith and follow me in a very simple prayer? You know, as you dedicate your life to God through this prayer, he is gonna fill you with his Holy Spirit and adopt you into his family, do so many good things. Take this step with me right now. Bow your head and close your eyes and follow me in this prayer. Dear God, today I want to thank you for speaking to me. God, I want to thank you for loving me. God, I want to thank you for your faithfulness to me. Today I'm turning from my unbelief. Today I'm turning away from my sin. Today I'm turning to Christ, your Son. I receive his sacrifice on the cross for me. I believe that he rose again on the third day from the dead. I believe he ascended to your right hand. And today, through faith in him, I receive your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you followed in prayer today, we're so thankful for what God has done in your life. You matter to God. You matter to us as well. Welcome to God's family. And uh, this is a great step that you've taken. We want to follow up with you. We want to make sure you have a Bible. We want to pray for you. Uh, We would love to hear your story, what it is that God is doing in your life. And uh, we just want to begin to do community with you. And so I want to encourage you. You can go to cclasvegas.org forward slash online. And you can click the button that says, I prayed. Share with us your information. One of our leaders will be in touch with you and um, make sure that you have a Bible and uh, they'll pray for you. 